good evening to all of you uh, it is with extreme pleasure that i am addressing all of you today evening very important day republic day and i hope i am audible right and uh, and a very important topic it is also coincidental that we are talking about federalism on the day a uh, constitution was formally adopted and accepted by the people of india uh coming to the topic of federalism i have prepared a small uh, slide which will be effective in communicating uh the points i'll just share the uh yes so broadly talking about the aspect of federalism we all know that uh, federalism is like a pendulum it will be more federal when the government is on a thin majority and it will be more centralist when the government is in the power with a thumping majority that it does not have to look back and therefore the shades and characteristics of federalism has evolved over a period of time from the from the adoption of our constitution uh, right uh, in 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 1950 51 itself after the adoption of the constitution we saw the first amendment act uh, of the constitution which was introduced in the parliament by uh, our first prime minister jawaharlal nehru although various rights were guaranteed to us in the first constitution uh, including right to property the effectively right to property was taken away by first amendment because various pro agriculture pro farming pro farmer legislations uh, were put uh, were protected by way of the first amendment itself and because of that the right to property was virtually taken away and there were a lot of disputes regarding all that even during the time of uh, uh, pandit nehru itself uh, into the 60s and 70s and after uh, um, mrs gandhi came to power congress was much more powerful and we also saw much stronger uh, union government at that time we also so had the first instance of emergency also during that time there were plenty of uh, constitutional amendments that were made which were in the nature of taking away or usurping the powers of the state during that time and subsequently we went into the 90s where the governments were of thin majority uh, and uh, the uh, prime minister and the governments during that time had the had to have the support of various smaller parties and various uh, regional parties so to speak and uh, these regional parties ensure that the rights of states are are given primacy and because of which federalism was in much stronger position in my opinion in 1990s it went in that direction in 2000 2010 during the time of upa and uh, in 2014 we had the occasion of uh, uh, the prime minister modi coming to power again with a thumping majority and uh, obviously because there is a very stronger government with a very strong majority we also have a uh, uh, we also have a gov government which does not may not give a lot of uh, importance to the states because of which we see a more centralist uh approach in so far as uh, the present polity is concerned uh this uh, i'm very much aware that i'm talking uh to all of you who are who are very much aware of the indian polity merely because you are going to be the civil servants of tomorrow torch bearers of rights uh, of tomorrow and i am uh, uh, i'll i'll just and uh, it is my it is only my endeavor to give a birds eye view of various shades of how federalism has evolved in the last 7 years from the perspective of a lawyer because many of these matters have come to courts and uh, many of these matters have been given different shades and different interpretations by the 
supreme court and sometimes by the high courts in the country uh, and uh, in that endeavor i'll be uh, discussing about some case laws i'll be discussing about the case laws mostly from uh, 2014 2022 perspective because i all the important case laws with, re with respect to federalism you may have already covered uh like uh, sr bombay and state of west bengal versus un of india etc etc which are very landmark cases on federalism which have established how uh, federalism in fact gives the uh, uh, broad edifice to the uh, constitutional structure of the country so the first case uh, which the country saw right after modi came to power was as we all know the njac case which was supreme court advocate on records association versus union of india this was 2015 judgment the 99th constitutional amendment was uh, passed by the parliament uh, and uh, which was right after uh, the uh, nda1 came to power and soon after that uh, it was challenged before the court it was challenged before the court uh, on various grounds uh mostly with respect to the question of independence of judiciary the composition of njac is not essentially relevant for present discussion you i'm sure you may all have looked into the composition of njac uh it was uh uh it was argued by fali nariman uh, in during the course of hearing that uh, it is only the law minister which is the member of the uh, national judicial appointments committee and uh, other members being the chief justice and other senior judges and two eminent persons etc etc but uh, it is only the law minister who is the member uh, and he is from the central government and because of which states did not have any say with respect to the appointment of uh, uh, judges and this was for the case of appointment of high court judges also so presently in the present collegium system once the uh, high court collegium which is comprising of three uh, senior most judges of the high court once they uh, um, formulate uh, uh, or ta or uh, tabulate the number of judges that are that they are seeking to uh, introduce into the high court the list will be given to the executive also state executive also and it is only after the state executives uh, uh, concurrence um that uh, it is then taken up and ultimately it will have to be approved by the supreme court collegium and then by the central government and warrant of appointment will be uh, notified so in the ngac system the state was given no importance there was there was no participation of states and because of which uh, federalism was introduced as a argument but because it was not pressed um, for reasons unknown uh, the court also did not give a detailed uh, uh, finding or discussion on this particular aspect it is my endeavor to say that uh, federalism was made an argument although in passing in the first uh, uh, first major case after modi came to power and that is njs um the second uh, important case that i would like to discuss in this aspect is harish chandra rawat versus union of india this is not a judgment of the supreme court this is the judgment of uttarakhand high court that i am discussing it it went to the supreme court but the, the supreme court gave only an interim order and the matter is still pending before the court and because of which i am not using the judgment of supreme court because it is not come uh, hari chandra rawat uh, was the chief minister harish rawat was the chief minister uh, uttarakhand 2012 election and uh, by 2016 what had happened was that uh, many congress mlas crossed the floor uh, and uh, defection was very evident applications were filed with the speaker under the paragraph 2 of the 10 schedule saying that defection had uh, happened and that they should be disqualified while all these things were happening harish chandra rawat was perhaps trying to salvage the government and um, a video surfaced where harish rawat was talking to various mlas and uh, um purportedly trying to offer money so that the government can be saved and uh, this video was used 
by the governor and a report was sent by the governor to the president then pranab mukherjee uh, who on the aid and advice of the council of the ministers uh, introduced uh, proclaimed um, um, uh, under article 3 of the constitution president's rule and uh, it was challenged rightly by the uh, um, the the chief minister then uh, harish chandra rawat before the uttarakhand high court various arguments were made including that uh, the relevant material for in uh, for proclaiming president's rule under article 356 was missing uh, and uh, various other arguments were also made because this dis- disqualification petition were pending and the timing of uh, president rule was alleged to be malified uh the matter went on for quite some time and uh, justice came joseph the chief justice at that time along with justice bisht uh quashed the president's uh, rule by the uh, um, uh, sitting as the chief justice and the puny judge of the uttarakhand high court and uh, it was held that president acted without adequate material so the uh, importance of adequate material was uh, uh, was in, was uh, brought for the first time by the uh, supreme court in sr bombay uh, judgment where it was said that there should be adequate material and the opinion of the president to introduce a president rule under 356 should be uh, well thought out and reasoned and there should be due application of mind so all these components are very essential for the purposes of proclamation of article 356 and uh, it was found uh, by the uttarakhand high court that uh, this was not there subsequently uh, the matter was taken up by the union of india uh, to the uh, supreme court uh, it was uh, mentioned by the attorney then attorney general mukul rawatki and uh, the court at that time um, issued notice and they and uh, the supreme court at that time gave an interim order saying that whatever be so what is extremely important is floor test and uh, there was uh, direction for a floor test uh, hari chandra rawat won the floor test and the government continued uh, because the questions in those in that matter was still relevant the, the the court thought it fit to keep the matter pending so that they'll adjudicate on the merits later and it is because of that reason that this matter is still pending uh this was the case of introduction of uh, pro- pro- proclamation under article 356 uh, and this is 2016 again during that time uh, in during the initial 2 3 years of uh, nda 1 uh, there were many such instances where smaller uh, states and the governments of smaller states and the states where government were of governments were of thin majority there were a lot of trouble uh, such a trouble occurred in uh, arunachal pradesh assembly and uh, in arunachal pradesh what had happened was that uh, um again few members who belonged to the uh, uh, congress there was an allegation of defection and uh, the five and the matter uh, went to the supreme court and supreme court uh, who was, sit, uh, was sitting in the combination of five judges because the court thought that the question which is in, uh, involved here in was important for to for it to be decided by the constitution bench so the five judge constitution bench of the supreme court held that uh, the governor advanced the as- uh, assembly session from january uh, from I, i missed the date here from january to december 16 uh, and uh, the advancement was to remove the speaker at that time the governor wanted to remove the, gov- the there was a factual situation where there was an allegation that the governor and the ruling party wanted to remove the speaker at that time and because of that they advanced the uh, session from january to december 2015 so that it could be done uh, the question arose as to whether the government can without the aid and advice of the government do that do what do the act of preponing a assembly session so this was the question and when this question was raised before the supreme court the court referred it to a larger bench which is five judge constitution bench and the court held in nabam rebia who he was the speaker at that time that uh, the governor's decision to advance the assembly session was unconstitutional 
so the most important ratio of this judgment was that governor can act only according to the aid and advice of the council of ministers governor indeed has discretion under section uh, article 163 but the discretionary power of governor is very limited and the discretionary power of the gov governor is only during certain circumstances when the government of the day has no uh, confidence and uh, such aspects were pointed out in this uh, constitution bench of uh, nabam rabia versus deputy speaker arunachal pradesh and this is also a landmark judgment in so far as federalism is concerned because governor's power uh, was interpreted and given a clarity by the honorable supreme court five judge constitution bench in 2016 and uh, in all the matters where the governor's powers are discussed nabam rabia is ostensibly cited so in this matter it was held that uh, the governor's discretion did not extend to the powers conferred under article 174 and hence he could not summon the house determine its legislative agenda or address the legislative assembly without consulting the chief minister or the speaker so this is very important these are this is the extract of the uh, Uh, or the court or of the judgment assembly the and the the governor could not summon the house determine its legislative agenda or address the legislative assembly without consulting the chief minister or speaker the functions duties and powers of the governor by or under the constitution are cabined cribbed confined so three c's here the basic it, it's it's very uh, uh picturesque in a sense that they have given three c's here to, to 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 give an impression that it is limited it is only limited and within four boxes within four corners of a box so when the chief minister has lost the support of the house and his strength is debatable then the governor need not wait for the advice of the council of ministers to hold a floor test so this was also uh, held by the supreme court in nabam rabia uh, this was cited in various uh, instances soon after that uh, we had the rebellion in uh, the rajasthan government where we saw sachin pilot along with few other mlas uh, raising uh, various uh, allegations against the chief minister saying that the chief minister does not have confidence and uh, the matter went to the court there was a disqualification petition against the uh, mlas who were supposedly supporting uh, sachin pilot and uh, when the matters were pending uh, again there was the question as to whether the govern uh, rajasthan governor could uh, refuse to summon a session because the, the chief minister of the day uh, ashok gelot in fact wanted uh, the assembly session to be uh, held at a particular time rather the governor was postponing it the question was whether the governor could do so so it and at the, the rajasthan high court when the matter was heard in an interim order said that the governor is bound by nabam rabia case and that he should act in aid and accord in in aid and advice of the council of ministers and if the assembly session was to be held at a particular date it had to be held at a particular date by the um, um, by the uh, this dictat of the gov governor so again there was interference by the governor in maharashtra where the new government was uh, was sworn in uh, and again in karnataka and in all these matters floor test was uh, was uh, stated to be the best remedy and the earlier the floor test earlier uh, the uh, justice in so far as uh, forming of government is concerned uh, the next case uh, that i would like to discuss is the uh, with res with the maratha case uh, jay jay sri lakshman rao party uh, versus union of india uh, in this case uh, the question was essentially with respect to the uh, correctness of uh, and uh, the constitutional validity of article 342a and also with respect to the uh, Uh, with, with respect to the uh, uh, the new law 
form made by the uh, maharashtra assembly where there was reservation for maratha community uh, it was challenged before the bombay high court bombay high court upheld the law where marathas were given reservation there was appeal uh, on that judgment before the honorable supreme court and supreme court in this judgment which is again a five judge but uh, bench of uh, the honorable supreme court held that the extent of reservation and uh, the kind of benefits the quantum of scholarships the number of schools all these things can be decided by the state it determination of a class may be given as a power to the central government but all the other aspects uh, that arise out of it like extent of reservation benefits that are to be given quantum of scholarship so once class is identified by the central government then all the attendant benefits or incidental aspects could be looked into by the state government and that that could not be a violation of federal, uh, federalism that was the uh, essence of what the supreme court judgment actually said i'll just read this out the extent of reservation the kind of benefits quantum of scholarships number of schools which are to be specially provided under article 15 sub clause 4 or any other beneficial or welfare scheme which is conceivable under article 15 4 can all be achieved by the state through its legislative and executive powers this power would include making suggestions and collecting data collecting data is given importance after uh, nagra judgment if necessary through statutory commissions for making recommendations towards inclusion or exclusion of castes and the communities to the president on the aid and advice of the union council of ministers under article 342a uh, but the uh, importance of this judgment is again arguable because of the reason that uh, the uh, 102nd constitutional amendment was partly uh, taken away by way of a subsequent uh, amendment which was introduced in the parliament uh, in the month of august last year 2021 uh, uh, it was there was again an argument saying that this uh, is against the federal principle um, as the state's power to determine class is taken away uh, so the court uh, this was the judgment by justice ravindra bhat Justice Ravindra Bhat was speaking for Justice Nageshwar Rao as well as uh, uh, Hemant Gupta, uh, but uh, Ashok Bhushan did not deal with the aspect of uh, uh, the state's federalism. Uh, but the Ravindra Bhat, who dealt with the issue, uh, was of the opinion that by these parameters, alteration of the content of the state legislative power in an oblique and peripheral manner would not constitute a violation of the concept of federalism. so uh, merely because the determination the power to determine classes is taken by the center but all the other aspects are still with the state that in itself is not a violation of federalism it is only if the amendment takes away the very essence of federalism or effectively divests the federal content of the constitution and denudes the states of their effective power to legislate or frame with executive policies that the amendment would take away an essential feature or violate the basic structure of constitution this is how the supreme court saved article 342a uh, in the in the maratha judgment and um, this again is uh, i was mentioning in passing um, because anyway the importance has been uh, reduced after the subsequent constitutional amendment um the next case that i would like to discuss is the kesham meghajandra singh versus the honorable speaker uh, manipur legislative assembly case so 10 schedule is something which is very contentious every time a government is put in power or there is a crossing over 10 schedule is invoked there are disqualification petitions um most likely uh, it is to save the government of the day and in some occasions the some M- mlas from the g- governing uh, ruling dispensation would cross over to the opposition also uh, but in in cases where 
the opposition MLAs come to the side of the ruling dispensation, um, it is in the interest of the governing uh, party that uh, disqualification petitions are kept pending or not acted upon. So what happened in Manipur was that one MLA had crossed over from Congress and joined the NDA government. And in fact, the Congress, the, the MLA who won from the from Congress ticket was made minister in, in the uh, Manipur cabinet. He was, uh, there was a disqualification petition pending against him. Uh, but the speaker did not act on it for years together. So the question arose as to why the speaker is not acting against uh, on, on that uh, disqualification petition. Because while considering the disqualification petition, the speaker only has to see whether he has crossed over from the party that he has uh, 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 he has been sent from and whether he's acting against the whip of that party. And if that is proved, then disqualification petition will have to be allowed and he will have to be disqualified. But this minister was serving in the ruling government and uh, the speaker was not acting because it was in the interest of the ruling government that uh, this qualification petition is kept pending. So the Supreme Court in this matter held that such disqualification petitions will have to be decided mandatorily within three months period. So it cannot go beyond that. In this particular case, in Kesham Meghachandra case, this is not 2020. I'm sorry. This is uh, oh, this is sorry. I'm, this is 2020 itself. So uh, there was the judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court came uh, in the month of uh, um, January, if I'm not wrong. So uh, uh, and in the judgment, it was uh, given a direction that the speaker act on it within 30 days. The speaker still did not act on it within 30 days after the Supreme Court intervened and said and gave that direction. And um, the, again, the issue was again brought before the Supreme Court. The court in, the, uh, by, this was one of the last working days of Supreme Court before it shut down uh, following um, COVID uh, uh, lockdown. So on March 18, 2020, if I'm not wrong, what the Supreme Court uh, did was that uh, the court invoked its powers under Article 142. Um, uh, under Article uh, uh, 142, and uh, held that uh, uh, he that the minister is uh, disqualified. The court invoked that power to hold that minister is disqualified. So the power of the speaker was virtually taken by the Supreme Court to hold that the um, the person is disqualified. Um, in the judgment, uh, Justice Rohindran Nariman refers to Justice J S Verma's. Uh, uh, dissent in Kyoto Holohan. Uh, you all know that Kyoto Holohan is the judgment where uh, the 10 schedule uh, is elaborately discussed because the challenge was against the 10 schedule. So uh, the aspect where disqualification petitions are decided by the speaker itself was doubted by Justice J.S. Verma in the dissent. And he was uh, of the opinion that uh, speaker being from the ruling, up, ruling dispensation itself may act uh, uh, in favor of the ruling government and uh, in such matters speaker may not be independent and to ensure that there is an independent uh, decision making process with respect to disqualification petition he suggested that a retired judge be appointed uh, as a tribunal to discuss to to be deciding that issue but anyway uh, the Supreme Court in this case in Kesham Meghachandra in fact gives a recommendation gives a suggestion to the parliament um, that uh, 10 schedule has to be looked into with respect to this uh, in the perspective of disqualification because it does not serve any purpose. The next case, uh, this is the extract uh, uh, regarding that uh, this is Rowinton Nariman's opinion. It is time that uh, parliament have a rethink on whether disqualification petition ought to be entrusted to a speaker as a quasi judicial authority. When such speaker continues to belong to a particular political party, either de jure or de facto, uh, parliament may seriously consider amending the constitution to substitute uh, the, the speaker of the Lok Sabha and assemblies as arbiter of disputes concerning disqualification which arise under 10 schedule with a permanent tribunal headed by a retired Supreme Court judge or a retired chief justice of a high court 
or some other uh, uh, outside uh, the independent mechanism to um, ensure that such disputes are decided both swiftly and impartially, thus giving real teeth to the provisions contained in the 10 schedule. Even I am of the personal opinion that 10 schedule should be looked into again because uh, it, it, it's not serving the, the, any purpose. There was this recent article by uh, uh, Sri Kapil Sibyl in, on the Indian Express where he discussed this aspect as to how 10 schedule um, is becoming redundant. Uh, he was saying that in 2002, there was a proposal to say the bunch of MLAs who cross over, if it, should, if it is two-third, it will at least be of some uh, benefit because the present uh, case where it is only one third uh, essentially does not uh, give any impact because what happens is that to cobble up one third of the, uh, the uh, one parliamentary group is very simple, especially when you come to a particular state where and when the states are small. So we saw that recently in, um, in Meghalaya and also um, in Meghalaya where uh, many Congress MLAs went to TMC and TM and it, it became TMC became one of the major opposition parties there without any disqualification uh, proceedings against them. Uh, the next issue is very contentious in many states, including the state of Tamil Nadu, uh, is with respect to NEET. So NEET, I'm not discussing too many case laws in that aspect because NEET, it has seen a series of uh, judgments and interferences from the Supreme Court. In fact, uh, uh, the question with respect to need, which came in the form of a notification was challenged and Supreme Court struck it down. Uh, after the Supreme Court struck it down in 2013, uh, the matter was again uh, taken up as, a, as the review petition was filed before the Honorable Supreme Court. Review petition was referred to a constitution bench. The constitution bench in 2016 uh, held that, uh, that there is some substance in the review petitioner saying that uh, NEET should be brought back. So the, uh, the review petitions were allowed and uh, subsequent to that, uh, the re NEET was sort of resurrected. And uh, there were plenty of other incidental issues which are considered by the Supreme Court from time and again. Recently, there was this case where uh, 27% uh, OBC reservation was also upheld by NEET and that again that was in an interim order. Uh, there are other um, important judgments with respect to NEET but question of NEET is essentially important in the perspective of federalism because uh, this is a case where higher education uh, and uh, which is essentially in the uh, in, in the uh, domain of state is taken up and usurped by the central government. And uh, the, there is a common examination on that. So states have started uh, protesting against it. Um, Tamil Nadu is the biggest example. Tamil Nadu, um, um, I recently read the news that uh, the chief minister is trying to talk to other uh, parties across the country to have a public opinion against NEET because uh, how far can uh, can uh, there be a central uh, dispensation go into the aspect of who should be and what should be the qualification etc for admission to to uh, the medical colleges are concerned so these are all matters which are of uh, larger import it's still in discussion and it's still uh, debated in the public. And in that perspective, NEET is an ongoing topic. And uh, according to me, it is going to be one of the most contentious issues insofar as uh, 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 federalism is uh, concerned. The other uh, judgment is uh, the judgment of uh, um, Union of India versus Rajendra Shah. Again, uh, 2021, by Justice uh, um, Rohinton Nariman, this was uh, three judgments. Uh, the judgment of Rohinton Nariman was concurred in great detail by Justice K.M. Joseph, but the, the K.M. Joseph also sort of gave a dissent in, a, in, in one uh, aspect. So I'll just discuss about this case. Um, 97th Constitutional Amendment, uh, which introduced Part 9b into the Constitution, dealt with issues relating to effective management of cooperative societies in the country. 
as we all know cooperative society is in the state list and uh, the parliament in 2011 passed the constitutional amendment without taking the uh, opinion or without uh, without uh, a discuss even a discussion or uh, uh, consultation with the state governments in fact uh, um the um, in although the Con cooperative society was and the amendments brought forward was broadly agreed by the states later on before uh, the um, amendment was passed there was nothing of that sort there was no discussion with the states so in this uh, judgment by the supreme court three judgments 2021 it was held uh, that if parliament is taking up the field of legislation of the states obviously there should there shall be ratification from half of the states because that is the mandatory uh, man, that, that, that's something which is mandatory as per article 368 of the constitution if the parliament is taking up the field of legislation of the states there should be ratification from half the states and in this uh, case there was no ratification from half the state was not even introduced so the supreme court held on this technical ground in fact this was very important uh, simply because there is no ratification by the state the amendment is bad and uh, then according to me it is a great judgment everybody should try and read this judgment to understand how federalism and the uh, larger domain of amendments are again discussed after keshavananda so um, it, there are certain criteria given for uh, introducing constitutional amendments and even if one technical aspect is not met and even if there is no serious uh, uh, objection by any of the state that there should be ratification supreme court can still go ahead and strike it down saying that this is one criteria and it has not been met uh, so the fact that there was no ratification by half the states was uh, held against the government this is a upa era um, constitutional amendment and uh, the nda supported it and it was struck down uh, last year uh, and um, the supreme court unanimously held that 97th uh, constitutional amendment required lat ratification uh, since it dealt with an entry which was uh, exclusive state subject uh, the union government cannot use its powers to make laws or control the cooperative societies of the states however this is where there is a dissent with respect to uh, the uh, judgment with respect to uh, so in so far as multi state cooperative societies are concerned the central government can legislate uh, and uh, constitutional amendment is valid in so far as multi state uh, cooperative society is concerned but in so far as uh, other states are concerned it, it is invalid so that's the majority opinion uh, this is concurred but Uh, justice rointon nariman was of the opinion that uh, with respect to multi state cooperative society it is valid but came joseph held that it is valid invalid even for multi state cooperative society because act itself was still bond so once the amendment is passed without the requisite criteria then the amendment itself is bad so the justice came joseph was of the opinion that you cannot hold a particular law as valid in so far as one area is concerned and invalid in so far as other area is concerned so justice rohinton was of the opinion that with respect to multi state cooperative society it is valid but came joseph was of the opinion that even with respect to multi state cooperative societies part 9b is completely in inapplicable so this was the uh, you know, judgment and in my opinion uh, this is a very well written judgment that everybody should try and read to understand the broader concepts of how um, amendment should be made and also as to how federalism should be understood in the perspective of how the state government and central government taking over each of their uh, domains are concerned uh the next judgment is one of the seminal uh, ones in so far as uh, federalism is concerned because the supreme court evolved a new concept called collaborative federalism in the delhi government versus union of india case obviously there has been a lot of dispute between uh, who would control what subject uh, in, in in the state of delhi uh, 
in this case, uh, the Supreme Court was, was very categorical when it said that with respect to land, police and public order, it is the central government. And with respect to everything else, it is the state government. So this is the uh, criteria. This is something which was there initially. And Supreme Court sort of buttressed this uh, in no unclear terms. So uh, the, the, Supreme, the, the court uh, in this matter, again, a constitution bench. So it was uh, headed by this, um, Chief Justice Deepak Mishra. So Deepak Mishra was uh, of the opinion that uh, the era of cooperative federalism has gone and we are now entering into an era of collaborative federalism. And uh, Delhi is a classic example of collaborative federalism because two governments are collaborating for the welfare of Delhi. So for land, police and public order, the central government and for the other aspects, state government. And such a distinct uh, political system is there in Delhi because of the unique nature that Delhi is also the national capital territory of the country. So this was the uh, judgment. Uh, it was also held that uh, LG is only an administrative head with only a limited power. LG is not a governor in uh, the strict sense. And he is also bound by the aid and advice of the NCT government in areas other than land, police, and public order. So in all other areas, if the state government is suggesting something, the LG mandatorily will have to follow that. Um, here, uh, there is a quote by uh, um, the, the Justice Chandra Chud held that the real authority to take decisions lie with the elected government and that the titular head has to act as per the aid and advice of the elected government. So the will of the people cannot be uh, cannot be toppled in, in a sense by going over it in the form of uh, very technical aspects. So this was the judgment in Delhi government versus Union of India. Uh, I'll Because the aspect of collaborative federalism is very important, I'll just have extracted this uh, uh, quote from uh, the judgment. So here it says, Constituent Assembly, while dev devising federal character of our constitution, could have never envisaged that Union of India, Union government and the state government could work in tangent. It could never have, the, never have been the uh, Constituent uh, Assembly's intention that uh, under the garb of uh, quasi-federal tone of our constitution, Union government would affect the interests of the states. Similarly, states under our constitutional scheme were not carved as separate islands for having a distinct vision, which would unnecessarily open the doors for a contrarian principle or gradually put a, put a step to invite anarchism. Rather, the vision enshrined in the preamble of our constitution, that is to achieve the golden goals of justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity, beckons both the union government and the state government alike. The ultimate aim is to have a holistic structure. The uh, aforesaid idea in turn calls for coordination amongst the union and the state governments. And the union and the states need to embrace a collaborative, cooperative federal architecture for achieving this coordination. This is the uh, uh, quote from that judgment, which I think is uh, relevant. Uh, there was another uh, case um, which was coming from uh, Pondicherry. So here, a uh, few MLAs were, uh, were nominated by the central government to the Pondicherry Assembly. So there were a lot of uh, uh, agitation saying that how can MLAs be directly nominated by the central government, although Pondicherry is, a, uh, is in a sense a government like that of Delhi, although having limited and lesser powers. So it was held that the nomination in the Legislative Assembly of Puducherry is not the business of the government of Pondicherry and that it is the business of the central government as per Section 3, Subclause 3 of uh, uh, the 1963 Government of India Transaction of Business Rules. So it was also held that uh, Article 239A of Constitution um, gave the power to the Parliament to enact a law to constitute Legislative Council for Puducherry 
and uh, for under this act of government of ut act 1963 and section 3 sub clause 3 it empowers and uh, central government to nominate not more than three members so uh, the, the, the there was this tradition uh, uh, that uh, the central government would take the concurrence of the local government to nominate uh, the members but in this case central government did not take the nomin uh, the concurrence or uh, suggestion of the uh, local government and they went ahead and appointed uh, the uh, uh, the um, mlas so nominated the mlas so to speak so in this case it was said that uh, taking the opinion of the local government is only a tradition and that it is not mandated by any law and on that aspect the central of uh, the supreme court upheld the nomination by the central government of three mlas in this case so in this matter also the um, the aspect of cooperative federalism is discussed because uh, again this is a unique situation uh, coming from pondicherry because pondicherry and delhi are essentially articles 239a 239aa presents a very peculiar situation and it, it it these are all examples which are generally staying away from other uh, other states some this is i'm moving towards some of the last cases in this uh, uh, session and uh, this is ajit mohan versus delhi assembly uh, after the delhi riots um, the delhi assembly had set up a peace and harmony committee so it was the uh, prima facie finding of the peace and harmony committee of the delhi assembly that um, facebook was used and perhaps manipulated uh, by the by certain miscreants to uh, to spread uh, riot and you know to perpetrate such crimes uh, what happened was that uh, the uh, delhi peace and harmony committee they issued a notice a show cause notice to ajit mohan who was the who is the managing director of facebook india and uh, ajit mohan challenged that uh, show cause notice before the supreme court under article 32 saying that his fundamental right is violated because such a matter could not have been uh, taken uh, at the instance of the delhi assembly so it was the argument of uh, um, uh, mr ajit mohan that uh, essentially facebook will be governed under it act and it act is a central legislation it comes under the central list and otherwise also uh, law and order in delhi is is under the central government so how can the state assembly take uh, such a uh, action and uh, state assembly give such a notice was essentially the question larger questions of federalism was again involved in this case which was harping on the issue of delhi versus center dispute uh it was held by the bench which was headed by uh, justice uh, sanjay kishan kaul uh, that uh, the the need to go into this incident both from a legal and social perspective cannot be belittled so this is the reason that supreme court is trying to give to uphold the uh, show cause notice given by the state of uh, state assembly the capital of the country can ill afford any repetition of the occurrence of such occurrence that is the riot in this case and thus the role of facebook in this context must be looked into by the powers that may be it is in the background in this background that the assembly sought to constitute a peace and harmony committee whether it has the legislative competence or not is an aspect we will deal with it under the relevant head the assembly being a local legislative and governing body it cannot be said that their concerns were misconceived or illegitimate it is not only their concern but also their duty to ensure that peace and harmony prevails however we may note that long and repeated battles between the state and center appear to have a cast uh, appear to have cast a shadow even over the well meaning intent of the committee to assess peace and harmony as reflected in terms of uh, reference so in this case it is very interesting to know that uh, the central government is uh, the, the sorry, i'm sorry the, the, the supreme court is again taking the example of the uh, uh, the uh, dispute between delhi and center to say that what your dispute is causing trouble for the normal people and uh, if the assembly is taking such a stand then why can't central government support it that was that was the uh, mood of the supreme court so so in fact the court 
you know, in my opinion, scolds state as well as the center because they are constantly bickering. Uh, so in paragraph 161, uh, the, the, the Honorable Court says, uh, speaking through Justice Call, to work well, the central government and the state government have to walk hand in hand or at least walk side by side for better governance. The failure to do so is really a breach of their respective electoral mandate. The seven Lok Sabha seats are all held by powers that be in the central government. And um, when, when it came to assembly election, it was the other, uh, it was a different party. This has been a repeat and it is the reflection of maturity of the electorate, which has chosen to put one dispensation in power in center while seeking to choose another state as um, another in the state as roles are as roles are divergent. Uh, the concerns are different. The two powers, unfortunately, do not seek to recognize this aspect. And that is the bane of this structure requiring collaboration and concurrence. So the court, Supreme Court is again saying that you should have larger collaboration in the interest of people. Unfortunately, it has become an endeavor to score points over the other. Some prior discussion and the understanding could easily solve, solve this problem instead of wasting large amounts of judicial time. Uh, in fact, current round is in our uh, view arising from the petitioners seeking to take advantage of this divergence of the view and their inability to see a common path. So in this case, Facebook was, in, uh, was, was, in the, was on the same boat as that of the central government because central government was saying that state could not have uh, issued such notice. It was also the case of Facebook that uh, state could not have uh, issued that notice. But ultimately, the court held that uh, anyway, somebody will have to see if some uh, mischief has been done in Delhi, uh, right? At the maybe at the instant of Facebook or uh, because of the inaction on the part of uh, Facebook. Uh, so here is where uh, uh, the uh, legislative competence of uh, was was considered. Uh, so the assembly admittedly does not have any power to legislate on the aspects of law and order and police in view of entries one and two of list two in the seven schedule in Trelia being excluded. So entry two of list two is police and that is excluded insofar as Delhi is concerned. Uh, and uh, further, even with respect to IT Act, it is uh, under the central. So the assembly does not perform the function of legislating. There are many other aspects of governance which can form part of the essential functions of legislative assembly and consequently the committee. In the larger context, the concept of peace and harmony goes much beyond law and order and police, more so in, uh, uh, in view of the on-ground governance being in the hands of Delhi government. So this was the explanation given by the Supreme Court to uphold uh, the notice. Uh, issued by the Delhi government, uh, issued by the Peace and Harmony Committee of uh, the Delhi Assembly. So uh, I'll just refer to this only in passing because this was not a major judgment or anything. Um, this was in the case uh, uh, with respect to uh, distribution of vaccines and uh, distribution of uh, oxygen during the peak of second wave. So the court, um, the, the Supreme Court speaking through Justice Chandrachu, uh, in fact, refer to section 35 and 36, uh, which relates to the power of central government to say that central government during the times of disasters should take greater power to ensure that states are also given their due share. So it was during that controversy where the central government had prescribed prices for vaccines that states will have to purchase. So, and then there was interference by the Supreme Court saying that states can't be forced to purchase for a price, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, the decision was rolled back by the central government. So this was in that context. And the, uh, the, the judgment uses section 35 and 36 of the Disaster Management Act to say that central government having powers does not mean that state should not be given their due share. Central government should take the powers to ensure that everything is distributed between the states equally for the welfare of people. So this was the larger... Uh, concept which was discussed very briefly, albeit I'll, I'll in uh, the uh, in in this order, uh, and this was in in re, in re distribution of essential supplies and services during pandemic. So this was uh, uh, this order came sometime towards the end of April, 30th April of 2020.
2021. Um, second wave, well, that, that, that sort of a situation is very important for trying to understand what the uh, decision of the court is in this case. So many questions were asked to the central government in this order. It, it, it's, it's not prescribing any law. It is this, uh, this order is not in the nature of laying down a law. But questions were asked. And questions were asked uh, with respect to the powers of the central government, stating that there are uh, duties, larger duties to the states. Um, this is the biggest question with respect to the money bill. Um, we all know Aadhaar uh, Act was uh, introduced in the parliament as a money bill. It was passed in the Lok Sabha. It was challenged in the Supreme Court. Five judge bench uh, of the Supreme Court upheld the Aadhaar Act, saying that uh, without, in fact, not going too much into detail as to why it was introduced as a money bill, although it did not uh, conform to any of the prescriptions of Article 110. Uh, Aadhaar Act did not discuss it, but the dissent of Justice Chandrachud is very important because in the dissent of Justice Chandrachud, the whole Aadhaar uh, structure has been struck down by the by, by Justice Chandrachud in his dissent, although that is not applicable, but his dissent is important because it was struck down. And while striking down, he said that uh, none of the criteria have been met and because of which the Aadhaar scheme and act itself fails. Um, this dissent of Justice Chandrachot was referred again in, uh, in a subsequent judgment of, again, the Constitution Bench of Supreme Court in 2018, which is called the Roger Matthew versus State Bank, uh, so so South Indian Bank. So the cost title is not mentioned here. I'm sorry. It is Roger Matthew versus uh, South Indian Bank. So uh, the judgment is by three authors. One, uh, Chief Justice uh, Ranjan Gogoi, uh, then uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Honorable Justice Gupta, and then by Justice Chandrachud. So uh, Justice Gogoi, uh, who was speaking for the majority, in fact referred to Justice Chandrachud's dissent in Aadhaar case. And he was under the uh, opinion that. Uh, this case, Roger Matthew case, was concerning Finance Act of 2017, which prescribed various conditions for uh, appointment and other service conditions of tribunals and tribunal judges. So, um, again, that was a Finance Act. Finance Act had uh, given, uh, had provisions relating to tribunals and tribunal judges, etc., etc., completely unrelated. Supreme Court was of the opinion that this could not have come in a Finance Act. And uh, Justice Gogoi in this case said that uh, criteria under Article 110 have not been met. And the question with respect to whether such um, laws can be passed as money bill was referred to an even larger bench because it, Roger Matthew was five judge and uh, uh, Aadhaar was also five judge. And uh, since the composition of judge, judges were the same, the court had to refer it to a larger bench for an authoritative pronouncement as to whether um, such aspects could be uh, legislated in the form of money. So uh, again, Justice Chandrachud's opinion in Aadhaar, the dissent in Aadhaar was referred to. Justice Chandrachud was again part of this bench in uh, Roger Matthew, where he discussed again in detail as to how Rajya Sabha cannot be uh, bypassed because Rajya Sabha, which is essentially the house of states, hold a lot of uh, importance in so far as bringing uh, forth uh, the opinion of states are concerned and bicameralism is a very important aspect of federalism and uh, bypassing bicameralism is something which is uh, against the basic tenets of democracy and uh, this is one very important aspect and uh, this was again referred to larger events in Roger Matthew. You may refer to Roger Matthew in this particular context and uh, the opinion of Justice Chandrachud and Roger Matthew and uh, Justice Gogoi in Roger Matthew is very important in the light that money bill aspect has been considered in detail and uh, the larger question of federalism on the uh, on Rajya Sabha being bypassed was also discussed. Uh, important judgment in that respect. I will uh, stop here with important Supreme Court judgment. This was one important judgment in the state of Kerala, in the High Court of Kerala. Gold smuggling case was 
uh, in the news every day for the most part of last year. Uh, various cases were filed um, and uh, various investigating agencies were involved in the state uh, um, because the aspect was gold smuggling and uh, customs had registered a case. Once the customs registered a case regarding gold smuggling, it was an, another twist was given, saying that customs and uh, bypassing uh, and um, um, smuggling of gold, which is essentially against uh, the uh, the fundamental tenets of economy, if that is done, then uh, it is also economic terrorism, and because of that, NIA registered a case under UAP. Alongside, there were other uh, cases under uh, uh, Prevention of Money Laundering Act also. So uh, the, there was a lot of tussle between central government and the state government. And in this case, uh, what happened was that uh, state government alleged, state government alleged that uh, central government officials, in fact, enforcement directorate officials encroached upon the powers of uh, state government uh, and influenced various witnesses. This is a very important allegation, extremely uh, serious. The, the state was saying that enforcement directorate officials influenced witnesses to testify against important uh, members. So uh, what happened was that uh, the crime branch of the state police registered a case. And uh, the case was registered uh, inter alia under article and the section 193 IPC, which is relating to offense relating to false evidence. Many other provisions were there, but for, for section 193 IPC was very important. So again, the question of federalism was raised as to how, in fact, uh, once the FIR was registered by the crime branch state police, enforcement directorate challenged that FIR before the Kerala High Court. And uh, Kerala High Court did not go too much into the aspect of federalism, but what, what, what was of the opinion, although it was argued, the, the Solicitor General came to the Kerala High Court and argued that this is completely against the all the federal, uh, all the important principles of cooperative federalism, that state government cannot uh, register FAR against central government officials when they are also investigating um, officers in uh, important cases. So, and uh, because section 193 IPC was involved, uh, the uh, FAR was ab initio void because of uh, uh, the protection given to the central government officials under uh, section 195 1 sub clause B C R P C. So the High Court held that uh, it could not have been done. Uh, the registration of FAR at the behest of the state police could not have been done. Um, for the reasons that uh, under CRPC itself it is wrong. They did not go too much into the aspect of federalism, although it was argued. This is again important in the context that uh, various investigating agencies are at locks with, with, with each other. CBI versus state police in uh, West Bengal um, and um, NIA versus state police and uh, customs versus state police in Kerala. Uh, in uh, Maharashtra, also there was the instance where when Sushant Rajput case was uh, uh, was registered in Mumbai police, uh, some other FIRs was registered uh, in Bihar and other NDA ruling um, government in states. And uh, there the case was referred to, was given to CBI. And then CBI started uh, uh, taking over the case in uh, Mumbai police de facto. So such aspects have been uh, very widely happening uh, across the country. And uh, investigating agencies are uh, versus state police, etc. Uh, is, is a big question of, of, of uh, federal conflict, which has still not been addressed by any court because maybe such a um, question has not arised, uh, arisen before the court in India. Uh, we are going into the realm of uh, important statutes during the last seven year period, uh, which are trenching upon the principles of federalism. Farm laws, uh, I do not have to explain too much in detail about farm laws. Uh, it was under uh, entry 33 of concurrent list that uh, the central government came up with three laws. 
entry 33 concurrent list uh, which was essentially on farming which, um, which is agriculture which is entry 14 stay list 2 so the challenges were uh, raised in the supreme court saying that legislative competence is, is one major ground that can render the law completely invalid but before the aspect was looked into uh, the central uh, the, the, the supreme court stayed the implementation of three laws i do not know how supreme court can stay implementation of a law because the rules were not framed so before even the rules were not framed such a stay could not have been given by the Supreme Court, although Supreme Court and even central government had agreed to it. It was probably uh, at the uh, suggestion of uh, the Solicitor General that Supreme Court, okay, we'll stay the, uh, uh, the laws. Anyway, the laws were withdrawn and uh, it still leaves a question as to how uh, the government can take over uh, very... Uh, a limited aspect of uh, trade and commerce and then uh, legislate upon it. And uh, the question as to how farm laws were passed in the parliament is a completely different aspect altogether because it was there was no division and uh, it was over a voice note. Uh, objections were raised, but still the laws were sought to be validly passed. The manner of passing farm laws is also important, and uh, that was again raised before the Supreme Court. But now the matters have become infractures because the, uh, the laws are withdrawn. Uh, Kashmir is extremely important from the perspective of federalism because Kashmir was a model of fully federal state within a quasi unitary setup. Uh, India is a quasi, I do not call India quasi federal, it's a quasi unitary <laughs> dispensation. Uh, India being a quasi unitary state, within that, the gov India is pregnant with Kashmir, which had full federalism. There was exclusive power for states with respect to literally everything, and the central government only had, as you all know, terrorism and uh, currency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but again, that was under Article 370. Invoking Article 370, subclause 3, uh, original uh, Article 370, subclause 1, was rendered invalid by the parliament. There was a separate uh, interpretation given uh, for uh, Sadari Riyasat, etc., etc., that you are all familiar under article 367 what amazes me really is how uh, statehood has been completely deleted so withdrawal of a state withdrawal of state is first time in the history of india whether that can be done at all is something which is very important because article 3 does not talk about deleting a state altogether so i have extracted article 3 here Formation of new state and alteration of areas, boundaries or names of existing. This is the title. The, the so parliament may by law form a new state. There is no difficulty by combining two or three states or whatever. They can form a new state. Increase the area of any state. They can take some area, increase it. Delete parts of states. That's also possible. Alter boundaries of a state. Possible. Alter the name of a state. Bombay has been changed. Well, yeah, that's also possible. Can you delete a state? Because Article 3 does not talk about it. It's still not discussed in great detail anywhere. So deleting a state could not have been done, uh, according to me. Although there are two sides of how you should approach Article 370. Some may say that time has come. Some may say that uh, 370 abrogation was completely bad. I had uh, filed a matter in Supreme Court challenging the abrogation of 370 for various grounds, violation of 21, 14, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, the, the, the kind of power that is available with the parliament uh, to completely take away statehood is something which is uh, shocking because what you, what you need is uh, you have to uh, refer to the state. So if, if you want to for example, in the case of uh, Andhra Pradesh, bifurcation of Andhra Pradesh, you seek 
the opinion of the legislative assembly there the legislative assembly can say that we are not agreeable for it or we are agreeable for it so whatever is the opinion of the legislative assembly the parliament can still go ahead and with uh, people present and voting they can uh, bifurcate a state or delete a state and what not so the kind of power that is available with the parliament in this aspect is completely uh, amazing because it can literally do anything so these are the reasons why i call india a quasi unitary state because center has overwhelming extreme powers um, let's see what uh, the so we we know what um, ias carter rules amendments are uh, all of you would have been following it i have extracted few uh, opinions of um, leaders against it many states have given uh, consent but many states have not given consent many states have uh, written to the prime minister and also the concerned department their, their objection etc uh, what uh, fascinated me the most um, and what in fact piqued my interest is the opinion of uh, kerala chief minister uh, who said here he said that it would invoke fear psychosis in the people in in the civil servants because when you are at the complete uh, control of the central government then how far will you be able to implement the policies of the state government so for example if you are you know managing director of a of a state corporation that is sent, that that is given the duty of implementing a project let's say that project is a pet project of that state government the party at the center does not like it and you are the managing director you are an ias officer central government can without asking anyone take you out of it and give you a separate uh, assignment in central government and you know maybe demote you so these are all aspects uh, which is very uh, concerning so in so far as uh, the larger question is concerned of federalism and um, it should be discussed in detail dam safety act is another act which was passed very recently there are plenty of examples i'm just discussing a few the dam safety act is one uh, act where especially in the tamil nadu the, the state where uh, the reservoir is in different state but the control of the dam is with the state of tamil nadu all of it will go to the central government in as per the dam safety act um, new committees and new uh, authorities are formed under the act um, state committee on dam, Sa dam safety state dam safety organization national committee on dam safety national dam safety authority etc etc the, the state's power is completely taken away so how far that can be done that is especially because of the reason that um, water is in the state list so if the water is in the state list under what pretext can the government the union government take it so the, these are all uh, important aspect entry 17 of the state list uh, the state can make laws on water supply irrigation canal etc entry 56 of the union list allows parliament to make laws on the regulation of interstate rivers and river valleys if it declares such regulation to be expedient in public interest so the union government while passing uh, dam safety act was uh, the, the minister concerned was saying in the parliament that it is in the public interest but how do you determine public interest whose interest have you uh, taken into account if you go to a person uh, who's uh, a farmer in uh, in uh, tamil nadu deriving water from a reservoir there uh, and he is saying that he is very happy with it is that taken into account perhaps not so these are all important aspects and uh, very clear violations of federalism but it is amusing that this uh, act was not opposed vigorously by even opposition parties in the parliament maybe for the reason that dam safety is a very sensitive issue but the opposition except for i think a few parties they, they, there was no opposition to uh, this bill the, the, the dam safety bill lok sabha had passed it much earlier it was passed very recently in rajya sabha and now it is an act so this is something which will have to be discussed in detail ports is another aspect uh, major ports minor ports major ports anyway it is with the central government because it comes in the union list minor ports with uh, uh, in the concurrent list and that's very important minor ports is in the concurrent list 
the earlier act is indian ports act of 1908 uh, indian ports act of 1908 uh, says that uh, control is with the state government but the new bill which is the indian ports bill of 2021 takes away the so the powers of the state government and it is vested on maritime dispute development council and uh, appointments to maritime dispute development council is done by the union government so again state's power is taken away uh, electricity amendment bill is one such example where electricity as as a subject uh, is uh, in the concurrent list and again uh, the uh, control of electricity in one state the regulation there of regulatory mechanism whatever you call it is with the state electricity regulatory commission and uh, state electricity regulatory commission members thereof appointed by the state government so the new bill proposes to create a new selection process selection committee where the members are overwhelmingly from the central government so how is that possible and again a question of federal um, federalism because now if you take if you take kerala as an example the members of state electricity regulatory commission of kerala the state government will not have any power so it will be completely determined by that committee and who are the members of that committee members of the committee is uh, headed by a retired supreme court judge and other members are uh, um, are from the executive secretary of the uh, of the power ministry is there two secretaries of uh, two chief secretaries from um, state governments will be there but uh, these state governments will be very different it's on uh, it's on rotation basis so this is it's on rotation basis um, so maybe the committee which comprises of chief secretary of maharashtra will determine the members of uh, scrc in kerala so, uh, how can you do that one question and again this committee is i the, the only member from judiciary is uh, the chairperson being the supreme court judge ex supreme court judge so in in roger matthew judgment which i discussed earlier in roger matthew judgment it has been very clearly held, held that uh, appointments to tribunals should be by a committee which is having majority from the judiciary because independence of judiciary is part of basic structure independence of judiciary is also something which is extremely important can the executive completely determine who are the judges in the tribunals because that's again is a question under tribunalization the various judgments have come series of judgments starting from madras bar association of uh, early 2000 2010 madras bar association 2014 madras bar association 2000 um sub so, so subsequently there was uh, roger matthew after roger matthew there was a recent uh, madras bar association where uh, tr tribunal rules was again challenged so in all of these matters starting from chandra kumar starting from Chand chandra kumar in series of judgments it's there where uh, it's very clearly held that uh, tribunals cannot be completely uh, um, the appointments cannot be made by some, the executive there should be a majority by the judiciary that is because judicial if you ensure that there are majority of judicial member there will be independence of judiciary and independence of judiciary is a basic right of the constitution and that cannot be touched so these are all issues again uh, under the realm of uh, federalism bsf act again you you may all know uh, 15 kilometers has been increased to 50 kilo kilometers in a sense the bordering districts entirely the they the bs bsf will also have power to arrest etc they they have sweeping powers so how far that can be done uh, so um, security national security is a um, defense anyway investigating agencies conflict in west bengal i had earlier discussed this is again a big issue which is continuing every new day you will see a new news of conflict between state government the state police and central investigating agencies <clears throat> gst uh, is uh, other aspect tamil nadu finance minister has been consistently raising the issue of uh, insufficient compensation from gst uh, council 
um, and uh, how how far is that um, considered by the council and how far the larger question of fiscal federalism has impacted the state government uh, after gst is something which is which will have to be discussed in great detail um, again uh, many states have obviously consented to it they are all parts of the council but many of uh, even if the, the, the ptr tyagarajan finance minister of tamil nadu had said that they are even considering uh, uh, you know, making a huge hue and cry and perhaps pulling out of gst council because their uh, um uh, their uh, their this thing is not uh, being considered at all um, national education policy something which I, i wanted to talk about is judicial federalism judicial federalism is a relatively new topic uh because federalism is equally applicable for judiciary as well uh the division of powers between states and uh, the state high courts and the supreme court uh in my opinion it's completely skewed uh the judgment of uh, njac had again reiterated that there will only be collegium system uh, but what is the collegium system collegium system is five senior most supreme court judges recommending for appointment of high court judges so what happens is that uh, supreme court collegium becomes the all powerful uh, um uh, body who is controlling appointments to the high court and uh, because of that high courts and high court judges become subservient to the supreme court judges and uh, it is only if you cater to the demands of supreme court judges that uh, the high court judges will be elevated to other high court uh, chief justices or perhaps even to the supreme court so it's it's uh, it's something which is completely um, skewed in the sense that um, there is a there is insubordination in a lot of aspects and that is not right and that is not even prescribed in the constitution because according to the constitution high courts are not subordinate to the supreme court high courts are equally independent bodies of power having having even larger powers because under uh, 226 of the constitution high courts have widest of powers so uh, such uh, subordination of high court is not prescribed in the constitution and it should not be there by way of various judgments of supreme court so for second judges case and subsequent be these judges case of prescribed a collegium system which according to the judges in njac case itself is bad kurian joseph after njac case has come come out on public said that he has regretted uh, <laughs> his opinion in uh, njac so these are all larger aspects of uh, that will have to be discussed judicial federalism according to me is will have to be uh, discussed and according and with this i close my Uh, uh talk and it was really great talking to all of you uh, i did not deal too much with gst etc because these are all technical aspects of on which i do not have too much of expertise so i i hope my this thing is of some use to all of you thank you so much